Hello and welcome to episode 19 of Anglican Unscripted. This is a, a neat little show where two Anglicans get to sit in their office chairs talking about all things Anglican. Sometimes we delve off into the secular world like we're going to do in a couple minutes, but our great hope is to make secular stories Anglican again. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And today is November 21st, 2011. We're going to return now to something that was very famous and made Anglican Unscripted famous, and that's called Today in History. That's where George and I sit and rattle about something that happened a long time ago. And we're going to rattle on here about something that happened November 21st, 1981. Who got shot that day? J.R. Who's there? The TV show Dallas, that episode, was up to that time the most watched television show, the highest rating in American TV. Sure. And it created a cultural, it was, a, it was the crest of a cultural phenomena of the prime time television show. Yeah, it really was because it, it brought soap operas to prime time. Now soap operas up until this point had lived in, in daytime TV. The uh, housewife would sit down and watch her guiding light, or uh, I forget all the different names. But uh, this, these producers said, "Hey, why don't we put a soap opera in prime time and see what happens?" I couldn't believe it. My own son letting some little no count out of catch swing of a big toe. Later, screw up the deal with a cartel. I thought I brought you up better than that. A woman's place is in the bedroom. Sure as hell, not in the boardroom. Very nice, Jock. Oh, didn't hear you come in, Ellie. Obviously. Now look, Miss Ellie, you know that I didn't mean to... I know what you meant. You believe that the woman's place is two steps behind the man. Except when walking through a minefield. You don't understand, Ellie. J.R. let that uppity Leslie Stewart spoil his deal with the cartel. Well, you and J.R. should know all about spoilers, Jock. Now, what's that supposed to mean, Miss Ellie? Everything you touch, you spoil. Relationships, people's lives. Well, Mama, I think you're exaggerating a little bit. Am I? J.R., you and your daddy use people up and then throw them away. Even members of your own family. You both sicken me. And they've done this with relative success up until mm -hmm. Dallas. Dallas hit the, the mark because of the what was called the cliffhanger. At the end mm -hmm. of each season, somebody was sleeping with somebody, but you couldn't see them under the covers. Somebody was shooting somebody, but you didn't know who. Somebody uh, was drowning, but you didn't know who until the next season. So mm -hmm. for 21 uh, weeks, America would be in this angst discussing who shot JR? And mm -hmm. that was, that's what er, every producer's dream, our dream at the end of Anglican Unscripted, every episode is to have people. Why just, don't they shoot <laughs> George <laughs> Con Kevin? <laughs> no, that's not our dream. Our dream is to have the episode discussed. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what um, means you've done something uh, interesting or, or productive as people talk about it. So, that was the magic of Dallas. Now, you have an interesting story about Dallas making international fame. Yes, Dallas was an international phenomena. It was 1999, I was visiting the Diocese of Um Zimbubu, which in Hoxha means place of the hippopotamus. Okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very poor, very rural diocese sure. in the eastern cape of South Africa. Mm -hmm. 
and I was accompanying the bishop on a visitation and we would go through these little towns and villages and and some of these places were really what I would call National Geographic African villages where the people lived in in the huts with straw thatched roofs and around the village would be a crail or a wooden palisade and one Sunday we we did a service and the bishop introduced me at the after the peace and said I was a canon of St. Matthew's Cathedral in Dallas well when the service ended and people came up to talk to the bishop and myself they ignored the bishop and they went straight to me and asked me about J.R. and Bobby and Pam and Sue Ellen see these people they had one TV set in the village and they would watch reruns broadcast from Cape Town of Dallas mm -hmm. and for them Dallas was real America was a place where women had big hair and blue eyeshadow and and uh, shoulder pads and Americans were wealthy and sophisticated and white men were evil it was just their image of the world and they wanted to know did J.R. go to my church were they Episcopalians <laughs> Well, and, and you I, couldn't say no. <laughs> I, I said, well, I do know some Episcopalians who want to shoot their wives yes. and sleep with their secretary. No, and that's just the interesting cultural phenomenon of television. Television has power. Video has power. And it wasn't just real for them in Africa. It was real for everybody in America. J.R. was a real character, and Larry Hagman would many times recount stories of walking down Ho Hollywood Boulevard and have people spit on him because they mm -hmm. thought he was J.R. And uh, it, was, it was a very difficult position to have his character be, become so real in real life. And finally, when we did show that, I mean, it was like the shot heard around the world. People, I mean, airline people, the pilot would say, we know who shot J.R. And people were going to restaurants and leaving before the show because they wanted to see that specific show. It was heady days, very heady days. And, you know, that's the story from November 21st, 1981, when a, a cliffhanger made a television series, Dallas, famous. Okay, in the news this week, we have uh, Bede Perry again. Uh, not because of anything he's done or anything he's said recently, but because presiding Bishop Jeffrey Shorey has put out a statement of her recollection of events of how he became a priest in the Episcopal Church in Nevada and um, her interaction in this and her responsibility in this. Uh, basically, she denies that she knew anything more about uh, him other than a single incident that was reported and that she followed the canons and did everything correct. The problem is that's a conflicting story with all the documentation we have from the B. Perry camp and what we know from the Abbey and from everything else in Nevada. Um, the second problem is the presiding bishop, Jeffrey Shorey, doesn't have the greatest credentials right now after walking around acting like Mussolini for the last three years. So bring us quickly up to date, George, what's going on and why is there such a big conflict? Well, after months of stonewalling, refusing to comment, refusing to answer questions, just ignoring the issue, and raising the ire of both liberal and conservative critics in the Episcopal Church, on November 16th, the presiding bishop released a statement on her role in Bede Perry's reception into the Episcopal Church. And the facts that she laid out conflict with the facts as reported by Bede Perry in a confession he's made and with investigations other people have conducted. Right. And he's made a videotape <clears throat> confession. He's put out a statement that's, uh, you know, been notarized. And it, you know, it's, a, it's an affidavit for all intents and purposes. Um, he's telling his story the way he remembers it. Um, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey uh, Shore is putting out a story as she remembers it, and they conflict. Um, mm -hmm. What's real specific is um, his, what he was allowed to do as an Episcopal priest. Um, he, he, she says he was not allowed to do what? But that his ministry was restricted. Right. And under the supervision of another priest, and he wasn't to have any work with, alone with children. Mm -hmm. Well, I contacted the rector of the parish in Las Vegas where he worked and laid out this information back in July, and the rector said he was not aware of these uh, issues in Bede Perry's history. Well, he said Bede Perry was a wonderful fellow, did a great job at the parish, and what I was tell and this what came in as a surprise to him. How can 
his ministry be restricted and the man under whom he's working not know about it? Or was it restricted in such a way that it wasn't made clear why it was being restricted? Whatever it is, this explanation being put out by the presiding bishop just doesn't smell right. No. And that's the difficulty she puts herself into. You can't walk around uh, deposing priests left and right for since 2006 and causing all the havoc you've caused, you know, kind of like the boy <laughs> crying wolf for so long, and all of a sudden she may be telling the truth in this, but nobody believes her. The liberals don't believe her, the, the conservatives don't believe her, and that's the difficulty when you go around doing what you've done for so long. I want to commend Alan Haley especially oh. and the Anglican Communion Institute sure. who have looked at the canons and have examined the evidence from a lawyer's eye and under the Constitution of the Episcopal Church Catherine Jeffords Shorey has broken the rules. Yes. There's no doubt about that. That she tries to say, oh it's the Diocese of Nevada's responsibility. Oh I just signed off. Other people were doing the investigations. The buck stopped with her. Yeah, in fact, up until a couple of weeks ago, she could have said that, but we now have canonical proof that no, the buck does stop with her. And, you know, it was not solely on Beads Perry's um, onus to, sit, to, to bring up all the facts. She had to do an investigation. And it would not have ta taken more than two or three phone calls to find out that he's a. Uh, got some serious issues, and the reason he's no longer a priest is because he has some serious issues. And what's she ad she admits that she he knew that she had he had been deposed, defrocked, dismissed, whatever verb you want to use, sure. from the priesthood of the Catholic Church in two thousand two, yet she received him, which is the technical term for taking a priest from one church to another into the ministry of the Episcopal Church. She didn't reordain him, yeah. she didn't start from scratch. She received him as if he were a good standing priest, not a priest who had been deposed for repeated child abuse. Right, and you can't do that. You cannot just receive a layperson into the priesthood. doesn't work. Well, see, the canons are ignored. Uh, one, see, this not only is this a terrible, terrible issue of child abuse, mm -hmm. it's systematic of the breakdown of the rule of law. Law is used not to uphold the truth and to keep the church on the straight and narrow, but as a weapon to punish opponents. The presiding bishop can break canons willy-nilly, not just in the Bob Duncan issue and the political stuff, but here in the basic instance of her job of having to be the chief pastor of a diocese. She was not able to do that and took in a child abuser as a priest. She broke, she broke the trust that she had with the clergy and the people of the Diocese of Nevada. Canons don't matter because she's in charge. And it's terrible. Well, there's the reality of the Episcopal Church. They don't hold their bishops accountable, this is what you get. Okay, this is kind of the segment I bet everybody's been waiting for, EMEA news. Well, there is no real EMEA news. There's news about EMEA, but uh, as you guys are well aware, they had a, a meeting between the Archbishop of Rwanda and, and Bishop Murphy in D.C. this week. Um, neither one has released a statement, and um, there's been a clamp down on information, which could be good for all intents and purposes. They may have had a real productive meeting as to uh, Amia's future with Rwanda. And I'll back up a step. Rwanda wants Amia <laughs> in their, their structure and culture, and they want it to be productive here in America. Uh, Amia, and backing up and giving some more information from episodes 16 and 17 and 18, uh, wants to find a new place for itself here in America and in Rwanda, not necessarily leaving Rwanda, but redefining who they are here um, as a missionary society. That's, in a nutshell, three episodes. Um, what we find ourselves now in is discussing what we've learned in educational about the canons of Rwanda and the canons of Amia over the last three weeks. We've had time now to look and see what they believe. And in 2008, they changed the canons. Um, Ke Kevin, uh, Canon Kevin Donlan, he's a friend of mine, uh, helped write the canons for Rwanda. Uh, but we, we look back with retrospect and say, who signed these? What's going on here? Uh, y this is, this is uh, basically Catholic without the Pope. And uh, you, what, what do you read here, George? Well, 
One of the things we've found over this past week is we've been in contact with many, many leaders of the Anglican Mission in America mm -hmm. and the Church in Rwanda, members the bishops and the leadership. And the Rwandan bishops, for example, have said, we're really at this stage going to speak through the Archbishop. Mm -hmm. We're not going to sort of break ranks because this is important to us. Sure. And we want to make sure we do it right. And so we know things are going on. We know Archbishop Moses Tay has written a letter. Uh, we know that there's this meeting in Washington, and we know that conversation is ongoing among the bishops of the AMIA. These discussions are going on, and it's important to allow them to, uh, to allow the facts to drive the story, not the reporting to drive the story. So we're sort of pulling back in that sense. Sure. But Kevin, you've raised a, a very important issue of the basis of the church doctrine right now. 2008, new canons were introduced for the Church of Rwanda and those canons cover the AMIA. And I have to admit, have to have been fallen down on this job. There have been bloggers, one in particular, who has been writing for several years about this change is, is crazy, it's not right, it's wrong, and here are these instances. And frankly, I just re read it and didn't really go deeper. When we had this story blow up, I decided to take another look. And in reading these things and reading for myself the canons and reading all this material, we find that the AMIA has a Catholic, Roman Catholic sacramental theology. They hold to seven sacraments, not two, which Anglicanism teaches. Mm -hmm. They believe in transubstantiation, meaning that while the accidents, the outward appearance of the wine and bread at communion remain the same, that's really Jesus' body and blood. Well, we Anglicans, according to the 39 articles in our church tradition, do not hold to transubstantiation as being the norm. No, we don't. In fact, uh, we had early church fathers die uh, burnt at the stake for believing you know, that. Uh, and we, we find ourselves down the, in the dichotomy of the, th the, we call them the three streams of Anglicanism, the Anglo-Catholics, the Anglo-Charismatics, and those in between. And what, where we go forward now is we've always protected and understood the 39 articles as being the hermeneutic of Anglicanism and how we interpret the Bible. And yes. uh, once you've shed those and got away from those or forgotten those, you've re you're either going to go purely Protestant or you're going to go purely Catholic, or Roman Catholic. And uh -huh. that's kind of the, the minutia we're stuck in right now is, um, Amiya, who do you want to be? We understand you don't want to be who you are now and you're evolving. That's great, but if you're going to remain Anglican, we, we want you to understand and respect the 39 Articles. Um, and have them as part of your canons. That hasn't happened. The issue for me is I. The issue as I understand mm -hmm. it, the AMIA clergy subscribe to the Thirty Nine Articles. They affirm the Gafcon and the Jerusalem statements. Mm -hmm. They have put themselves forward as being part of the Reformed Catholic Church. Yet the theology that they are under obligation by their canons to accept is one that contradicts the GAFCON and the Jerusalem Statement and the 39 Articles. In other words, there's a disconnect between what they think they are and what they legally are. And I can't see how that, how you can hold together in that integrity. No. See, Anglicanism always had as a base the 39 Articles and allowed you to interpret things so that you could be a good Anglo-Catholic and believe truly in the real presence and draw your strength and substance from the 39 articles and interpret them and understand them in a certain way. I'm not saying an Anglo-Catholic is outside the faith. No, Please don't all. mishear no, me. Not at all. But what I am saying is that when you change the ground underneath everybody and when you impose a Roman Catholic basis for Anglicanism, I as an evangelical cannot find my theology or my basis or my Bible in these canons. Yeah. They're un-Anglican. And that is a shame. And that is the problem. And and I think that's, we're going to see what happens with the EMEA. Um, are they going to become a missionary society, a Jesuit society, uh, and, and draw more into the Roman Catholic uh, um, faith? Or are they going to remain Anglican? We don't really know. Um, that will come out over time. Um, but whatever they do, we will respect and honor them who, who they are. Um, 
the problem being is what makes an Anglican is the 39 Articles. We're not just Catholic without a Pope. Okay, we have Alan Haley on the other line. He's, well, gosh, it's 5.30 a.m. where you are. Yes. <laughs> we, uh, we, we delayed... Like Anglican TV. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we delayed Anglican or Unscripted today uh, a bit uh, because we have breaking news coming from Georgia, and we're going to cover a lot about uh, what happened in South Carolina. First, the Georgia decision. Um, the, the courts came out this morning. They gave a, a 45 page uh, opinion and a 96 page dissent um, and basically if I if I understand this correctly uh, the churches lose yeah the local um, the church of Christ Church in Savannah that pulled out of the ch of the Episcopal Church in the Diocese of Georgia in 2006 uh, has now lost its property by the decision of the majority of the Georgia Supreme Court and it goes to the Episcopal Diocese of Georgia and to the a minority congregation that they recognize as Christ Church. So that's the ruling of the court. As I say, it took them hundreds and hundreds of pages to reach it. It's basically finding that the property was impressed with an implied trust uh, through the many years that the parish first joined the church in 1823 and then several times um, reaffirmed in various ways that the court found significant. Uh, the constitution and canons of the national church, and so it's a um, it's a decision in a sense that, as I say, takes a long time to explain why they have to rely on all these little minor details to find that there was a trust there because there's no express trust document, nothing signed in so many words, of course, by the parish congregation. So are they relying on the Dennis Canon, or what are they relying on for their trust issue? Yeah, Dennis Canon was just one of the factors. Okay. Uh, and the, without all the other things there uh, on conduct on the part of the congregation that the court found significant, uh, the Dennis Cannon probably alone would not have been enough to do it. Although in a companion decision, um, uh, the Presbyterian Church, National Church, the court there had reversed a decision of the um, Court of Appeals in which had found in favor of the local church and against the national church's trust provision equivalent to the Dennis Canon. So this, by reversing it, now they've taken the property of that local parish away and said it's uh, to be given to the national church on the same ground. So, as I say, it's a 2-0 um, victory for the national churches in Georgia this morning. Well, and I think the bigger problem is a lot of case law always referred to Georgia because they had set the standard for so many years as to how they dealt with title property, always in favor of the church in the past. Yeah, this is uh, this has implications for further proceedings because uh, it's it's not trivial to observe that since 1969, every major Supreme Court decision, Supreme Court of the United States decision on church property issues has come from the state of Georgia, from decisions by the Georgia Supreme Court, mm -hmm. uh, starting in 1969, and then, of course, the most famous one, Jones v. Wolf, mm -hmm. in 1979, was a Georgia case. So if this does, uh, you know, and with the conflicts this creates uh, uh, with the South Carolina decision and some other decisions across the country, it's now probably more ripe than ever for this issue to be taken up to the United States Supreme Court. And we always keep saying that, but they always keep turning this down. Well, of course, they turned the California down, uh, but that was on, could have been on the grounds that the California case was not final yet. It was still had more proceedings. Yeah, that's true. To the court. So that's the last time that any Episcopal Church case, anyway, presented itself to the U.S. Supreme Court. And so we can't conclude anything from that. The interesting thing about any current uh, petition up to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, for review is that the composition of that court. Um, there are six Catholics sitting on that court and three people of the Jewish religion. So <laughs> uh, you have a, no Episcopalians or Protestants on the court whatsoever and so whether they will be sympathetic to these kinds of issues is, remains to be seen. Yeah, that, that is interesting. Uh, the, 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 the current makeup of the court, let's, let's hope that's what we get when we get there. All right. <laughs> okay. Now, I am a big fan of chess, 
and I, I'm not sure if you are or not, but yes. I, I, I uh, have noticed. Hey, Bobby a, Fisher, I'll have you know. What's that? I once played Bobby Fisher when I was 12 years old. <laughs> You've got to be kidding. Wow. Okay, well, then you're going to appreciate the next story more than anything. And, and that's the ability to uh, really defeat your opponent early on by sacrificing a queen or something. And uh, uh, that's exactly what we notice here in the Diocese of South Carolina. Uh, Mark Lawrence has sacrificed his queen and by doing so put tech in check. The, the, they're now without any move whatsoever by what's called the uh, quit claim deed. Correct. So uh, let me know what's going on here because I love this. Okay. Yeah, first we have to have the backdrop, of course, of the Pauley's Island decision by mm -hmm. the uh, South Carolina Supreme Court, which expressly held that the Dennis Cannon was not effective to create a trust on church property in that state because it was uh, the expression of a national church which didn't own the property and the actual parishes which did own the property uh, had not signed anything in writing making a trust in favor of the national church, which is required by South Carolina law. So uh, in that backdrop then, you have the court saying we're not going to uphold anything based on claims based on the uh, Dennis Canon in favor of a diocese in South Carolina. So recognizing that, first of all, um, Bishop Lawrence did not take any issue with the withdrawal of St. Andrews in Mount, Saint, in, in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Sure, yeah. And, uh, and also has, uh, you know, but there has not been any other churches which have left in the meantime. Now we find that he has been in the process of assuring those churches that they will not be harmed by staying and subjecting themselves to claims of any kind of an implied trust because he has given them each now uh, or rather the diocese has given them quit claim deeds of any interest whatsoever that the diocese might have or could have in their property whether by virtue of the Dennis Cannon or anything else. Now what's and, remarkable that I saw is he didn't sign the documents the the legal authorities in the diocese did. Yeah, it, it's actually he as bishop uh, has no title himself to quit claim or anything like that. It's mm -hmm. the diocese that has to do that. So the diocese has to authorize the appropriate person to sign the quit claim deeds. They were sent out by the Chancellor Wade Logan, and uh, Chancellor Logan gave each individual parish the option of whether they wanted to record it or not. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a step where uh, the diocese went ahead and instantly recorded every release of all its claims, but it's given the parishes those deeds and that thereby cuts off any possible claim such as today prevailed in Georgia and would prevent anyone from coming uh, back in South Carolina uh, based on events up till now anyway and uh, making a claim that these parishes uh, you know were impressed with a trust in favor of the national church. Because what happens here is people will say what about the Dennis, Dennis Cannon? Well the Dennis Cannon doesn't apply unless you're trying to leave the church. Well, that, yeah, that's the weirdness of the Dennis Canon. It's yeah. a trust, but it only comes into play if you try to leave the church, because while you're in the church, you're free to do whatever you want with your bank accounts, your money, to spend them on anything you want. Uh, nobody's going to check you. I mean, yes, in a few cases you have to get approval to get a mortgage on the property, but pretty much anything else you want to do with your property um, is yours to do as long as you're still in the church. and. Uh, it's kind of a, a foolish doctrine because to me the whole point they say of the Dennis Cannon is well we've got to maintain the property uh, that our forebears you know donated for church purposes well no they don't because the churches are perfectly free as long as they're still in the church uh, to do what they want with their property and so um, for example your St. Paul's there in Connecticut is mm -hmm. uh, testing the de validity of the Dennis Cannon Trust while they are remaining in the Episcopal Church and that's a good way to do it yeah, it is. It's, it's genius stuff. Uh, Alan, I want to thank you for getting up early uh, in your time zone on, on the West Coast to to read this uh, huge... Uh, yeah, uh, it's going to take a lot of digesting. I'll, come, I'll have some more to say about it probably next week, too. Well, good. It, well, for me, it's a race against time. I have to get my video online before you start posting on <laughs> Anglican curmudgeon. <laughs> Who's going to have the breaking news? But thank you again for your time, and uh, yeah. uh, catch you again next week, I assure you. <laughs> God bless. <laughs>
I know. <laughs> Not my favorite thing to do, but the, the Pope has noticed that there's uh, some uh, a little friction between Anglicans and, and uh, uh, other functions within the Anglican Church. And says, I have, I'm going to offer what's called the Anglican or Ordinariate, and you can come back and be Roman Catholic, even if you're clergy, a priest, and uh, uh, be part of the one Catholic Church again, and uh, our interpretation of it. And uh, they're going to do it here in America. It's being offered in England. Um, but I want to talk about an interesting letter I just read from the Bishop of London, um, mm -hmm. who says, um, okay, all you people who've been uh, papal bound and papal wanting to leave for the longest time have been, have been pretending to be an Anglican, now's your chance. Yep. Yeah. Yes, Bishop Richard Charters released a letter uh, this past week saying that Anglican clergy and co congregations that use the Roman Catholic Missal. Wait, stop, uh, stop, stop. Is that a weapon? Uh, yes, it's a uh, third stage ICBM, okay, I got it. or it's a prayer book that the Catholics a use. Missile, got but it. All right. I think he was. <laughs> I think he was talking about the prayer book. Got it. But <laughs> if there are congregations in Britain, mm -hmm. uh, Church of England, where they use the Catholic prayer book, the Roman Catholic prayer book, and they, uh, and because a new Catholic prayer book is coming out very shortly, the Bishop of London is saying, look you have to make a decision. You cannot use this new Catholic prayer book in the Church of England services. Uh, if you feel called to do that, join the ordinary, join the Catholic Church. Don't try to have it both ways. Now this week or next week, they're, they're, I'm not exactly sure the timing, they're starting this up here in America. Uh, it's going to be led by some people here in America? Yes, the uh, last week the Roman Catholic Bishop Conference announced that the official start date is January 1st. Mm -hmm. And the name of the Ordinariate and its initial leaders will be announced at that time. And the uh, they're expecting maybe 2,000 lay people and maybe about 100 clergy from the Episcopal Church and other, and other Anglican churches in America to come in and be part of this first wave of Catholic reverts, they like to call it. <laughs> I, I would say their numbers are kind of high, but uh, it, it'll be interesting to see the, the flow, um, because uh, it, for all intents and purposes, there is uh, f fracturing in the Anglican Communion, uh, and some people would just you know, find a, 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 it better to be un, under the fathership of the Pope than have to worry about this constant struggle within the mess we call Anglicanism. And it's interesting, some of the documents released by the Catholic Bishops' Conference mm -hmm. Uh, really do show that the Catholic Church is coming d down on a particular side in the inner Anglican fight. Yeah. Uh, they released a Q&A, uh, a, a frequently asked questions page on the uh, new ordinariate, and I'd like to read you one passage. And they, they asked the question, is there a difference between Episcopal and Anglican? And the Catholic Church said that parishes that are part of the Episcopal Church belong to the worldwide Anglican Communion, under the spiritual direction of the Archbishop of Canterbury in England. Thus, they are both Episcopalian and Anglican. However, other Christians in the United States identify themselves as Anglican, but are not part of the Anglican Communion. These Christians, therefore, are Anglican, but not Episcopalian. You hear two things in there. Sure. They're saying the Episcopal Church is under the spiritual direction of Rowan Williams. Now, someone better tell Catherine Jefford Shorey that. <laughs> and second, they're saying that we that the Episcopal Church does not have the exclusive franchise on Anglicanism in the United States as far as the Catholic Church is concerned. No, I mean that clearly identifies the Recognize Act uh, and uh, uh, continuing Anglicans here in America as having uh, just as much rights uh, to identify themselves as Anglicans as Tech does. Yeah, and I have to say this is uh, this is a smack. This is this is not a good neighbor policy. This is a Catholic Church being very strong, sure. very assertive, which is a good thing because the churches need to stand up for what they believe and be clear and straightforward. And I applaud the Pope for this work. Mm -hmm. I'm not tempted no. to go over. Uh, nor am I, but um, it is needed because there are those who uh, just are not comfortable with um, uh, the chaos that is Anglicanism. Now, you and I truly believe Anglicanism will find its way 
but um, I until then, there's people who are like, you know, why do we have to fight every day? I have a classmate from seminary mm -hmm. who will probably avail himself of the ordinary mm -hmm. and, and will probably become a Roman Catholic, uh, become a priest under this uh, provision mm -hmm. when it's all finalized. Sure. And some of the differences are he is not leaving the Episcopal Church, he's not joining the Catholic Church because he's angry and mad at the Episcopal Church. A lot of people are. He's, he's joining because he believes the claims of the Catholic Church are true. He believes in the bodily assumption and the virgin birth of Mary, the Mother of God. Sure. Things that we don't necessarily believe that are not part of our tradition. He believes them to be true. However, he cherishes and loves his Anglican heritage and the prayer book. And so this way forward is for, not for people who are mad at the Episcopal Church, but for people who believe in the teachings of the Catholic Church, but wish to retain their Anglican heritage. Sure. So, what, what, and that's a good thing. I think that's a positive, positive step forward. It, it is positive, and uh, it's interesting who's not jumped on onto the bandwagon yet, and who, and who has already left. And we'll talk more about that in future episodes. Over there, Yorkshire, England. What part of England are you in? Canterbury, aren't you? <laughs> Down in Kent. That's nowhere near Yorkshire. <laughs> yeah. Where did that come from? Oh, come on. I don't have a map in front of me. Eat my friend, Yorkshire. <laughs> my friend Peter Old is over in Canterbury. He's bringing us the UK news. And we're we'll going to talk uh, real quick about women bishops in the UK. Um, up until now, it hasn't happened. Um, we visually see a lot of support in the diocese, but we, when it finally gets to the Senate, it doesn't go forward. What's going on? Here's where we're, we're at. We spent the last five or six years in a slow process moving towards having women consecrated as bishops in the Church of England. Yeah. And the stage that we've just completed is that, is that the legislation, the kind of draft legislation has been drawn up, it's gone through a few edits, and now it's been handed on to diocesan synods, and they all have to agree. And the news this week essentially is that that process has now finished and it's only about three or four synods, diocesan synods, who have voted it down. So all of the 40 plus synods, most of them have voted in favour. The average vote in favour of having women bishops was about 75-80% across the um, synods. Now given that the legislation needs a super majority in all three houses, which would be about 66% of the vote. It looks as though it's a done deal. And certainly, a lot of uh, inclusivists and, and people who are in favour of uh, women being consecrated as bishops are basically cock a -hoo. You know, this is, this is it. It's just wait until uh, June and uh, July next year when General Sinner has the final vote and Bob's your father's brother. If it were that simple. Uh -oh. You see, Here's the thing, yeah, uh-oh, here's the thing, it is undoubtedly true that there is a super majority in all three houses in general synod of the Church of England for, for having women consecrated right. as a bishop. The problem is that there is very clearly not a super majority in favour of it with the current safeguards or so-called safeguards in place for those people who, who oppose this, this uh, view. So what we have at, 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 at the moment in the legislation is a code of practice which hasn't been technically drawn up yet, which is essentially how bishops should deal with congregations and clergy who refuse to accept having a woman as a bishop. Here's a problem, it's not statutory. It's not statutory, so however well-meaning, however nice we think a bishop will be, when push comes to shove, at the moment, because it's not a statutory code of practice, the bishop can go... Uh, at, uh, essentially, at the moment, what the legislation says is, is that the bishop needs to have regard to the code of practice. Well, have regard can mean something as simple as, as this. I'm going to use my uh, Church of England newspaper from this week, just for example. <laughs> sure. The bishop will go, here's my code of practice. Hmm, I have regard to it. That'll do and do something entirely different. Right. And so what happened in, in the in the Diocesan Synods is that, is that in, a, in a lot of them, as well as being asked whether they would they they wanted women to be bishops, they were also asked, and some of them, motions were, were put forward, which, which was basically asking for strengthening of the safeguards. 
And what's interesting is, is that even though on the general issue of women bishops, the vote against was around 23-24%, when you start asking questions about would you vote against if it didn't have the proper safeguards, the numbers voting against go up to about the 32-35% level, which is right into blocking this super majority. So it looks as though the passage of women bishops might not be as easy through general synod in June or July next year as people think. It looks as though if there are enough people, and these could be people from from all sides, so it could be people who are fundamentally opposed to, to having women as a bishop, there are people who are probably fundamentally opposed to having women as a priest in, in sure. the first place, yeah. but they've lost that battle. Yeah, so it could be those people. It could be people who are in favour of women bishops but want to see stronger safeguards for those nice friends of theirs who, who oppose. But on top of that, there's a quite a, an increasingly vocal group of those who are in full favour of women to be bishops who want no safeguards whatsoever. And they might think it's worthwhile booting it out at this point so that in five or six years' time when it comes back, they can get a stronger motion. Yeah, so those people who are, who are basically saying what the Dalston votes shows is that this is a done deal, it's going to happen in June or, or, or July, are not looking at the politics of this. It may yet go to the wire. I think you're, and now, you're ready again. Now I'll let you talk. <laughs> You'll, no, no. Well, the reason we have you as a, a correspondent is because you know what you're talking about. When I talk about women and bishops in England, I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh. I know they'll potentially they'll wear purple. <laughs> and, uh, yes, potentially. Yeah. <laughs> or nice shades of uh, lilac, yes. But that's, a, that's about as far as my knowledge of women and bishops in, in London would go. So yeah. um, that's going to be interesting because eventually I think time will be on the side of those who want to have women bishops. Oh, well, you know, mm, you you would uh, you would you would think that when general when the last general synod was elected, so last year there was a big push by the more liberal wing to get a lot of candidates in and to basically make this a done deal, and then to push forward on the whole human sexuality issue, which is another right, question yeah. <laughs> and, entirely. That really didn't work. It didn't really. Um, it, it seemed that 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 kind of push from the inclusivist camp is now generally regarded to have failed. So General Sinner this time round is as conservative, if not more conservative, oh, wow. than than last time. Which 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 isn't to say that it's ravingly cons cons conservative. It's just to say that you know there's a, there's a sizable group who are basically doctrinally sound and won't have, have anything to do with you know uh, stuff. That isn't doctrinally sound. So to say that time is on their on their hands, well, I don't know really. I mean, it could be that there's there's a significant group of those people who basically want a, a very simple motion, which 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 basically says women can be can be bishops, and there are no safeguards for anybody else who doesn't uh, agree. And it could be that that they think time is on on their hands, so they push it off for five years, which is what would basically happen. If it got voted down in next June or, 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 or July, that's it. They couldn't even begin to start um, thinking about it until the next convocation, which will be voted in in about three or four years' time. Okay. So they may think it's worthwhile waiting in order to to get a single motion, which which, which, which basically just, just says women can be bishops, and if you don't like it, that's tough luck. All right. Thank you, Peter Old. Okay, George, we're going to talk about the uh, Diocese of Central Florida. There's bishop news down there. Uh, this is your diocese, so we're going to let you do the lead story here. What's going on? Greg Brewer, mm -hmm. the rector of Calvary St. George Episcopal Church in Manhattan, was elected bishop of the Diocese of Central Florida on Saturday the 19th of November. And he was elected on the fourth ballot, and boy, I think it's wonderful news. It really is, because he's a charismatic, he's evangelical, and he has those leadership skills um, that will really be good as a bishop. I think this is a great transition for him uh, in his cl clergy role. Greg, uh, we, well, it was, uh, we were spoiled for choice in Central Florida. We had seven candidates, and frankly, any of the candidates, uh, I had 
I had six favorites, to be <laughs> frank. Yes. <laughs> there were six people I could have voted for mm -hmm. without any hesitation. Sure. Um, but Greg Brewer won. Uh, he was the one candidate from outside the diocese. And he's, as you mentioned, he's a charismatic, uh, uh, theologically, spiritually. He's a wonderful pastor. Mm -hmm. I've known him for, gosh, going on 15 years. And I know that his ministry will be blessed and will be blessed down here in Florida right. with him in our leadership role. Well, and there's the problem. He's a conservative, charismatic, evangelical. Will he make muster as a, get past all the things he has to do to become a, a bishop in the Episcopal Church, which he has to be approved by the House of Bishops, by the House of Laity, and uh, by each diocese. Um, uh, there's Bishop Mark Lawrence, who is the uh, twice elected bishop of the Diocese of South Carolina. Um, there's uh, Bishop Love of Albany. There's the new Bishop of Springfield. There's really a process, uh, an extra uh, layer of vetting that goes through if you're a conservative. Is this going to happen with uh, uh, Greg? No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there will be vetting. Yes, the bishops with jurisdiction and the standing committees of the Diocese of the Episcopal Church will look over this election closely. Central Florida is an outlier. It's a diocese that's doing well, that's conservative, that has very strong evangelical and charismatic and Anglo-Catholic congregations, and it's going to stay that way under Greg Brewer. Mm -hmm. now, I, now, several things. One, I do not believe there is the political will to block Greg Brewer at this time. I just don't see uh, a fight being this being a line in the sand for people who want to uh, kick out the few remaining conservatives. Sure. I just don't. I just don't see that. I don't feel that. And in talking to people in the wider church, I'm not hearing that. Okay. And second, Greg Brewer is a true, holy, godly man, and there will be some people who, out of pure political spite, will say no. But I don't think that the entire Episcopal Church has been taken over by people animated by uh, base emotion. Well, this would be a great segment going from Greg Brewer uh, onto the newest bishop in the Episcopal Church, uh, Bishop Marion Budd uh, from uh, D.C. And mm -hmm. um, she just put out a, a great interview. If you're an Episcopalian, you have to love this interview. Um, well, give us a little background on her and, the, and uh, what she says to build up in the church. She's a 51-year-old mm -hmm. priest uh, uh, coming to Washington from the Diocese of Minnesota mm -hmm. where she was successful in building up a congregation and she is a true blue liberal. She believes in the path tra taken by the Episcopal Church over the past 10-15 years and she thinks that if the Episcopal Church just did more of what they were doing they would capture the imagination of people and bring people back into the church. Now George and I, we have to agree, uh, keep, the Episcopal Church, keep doing what you're doing. Um, you know, the, we, we want more revelation as to uh, what works and what doesn't work, and if you think this will work, please try harder. Well, you know, wasn't it Albert Einstein or somebody who said something like, insanity is uh, doing the same thing over and over again? <laughs> and expecting, and what, expecting a different result, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying Bishop <laughs> Bud, who was consecrated this past week, is insane. No. I think that she's the right person for the Diocese of Washington. That is who they are. Sure. They believe what she is saying. Yeah. And if anybody is going to be able to put into practice the beliefs of the Episcopal Church as she is articulated, it's her. Yep, absolutely. So let's see this experiment work and apply the Gamaliel test. If it's of God, it'll succeed. Absolutely. Yep. And, uh, uh, we, first of all, as Christians, we do pray that she is successful and that people come to Christ. As observers, well, we'll have to see. All right, you guys have just watched episode 19 of Anglican Unscripted. Two gentlemen, George and Kevin, got to talk about all things Anglican. Even though they weren't Anglican to start, we made them Anglican in the end. Isn't that cool, George? <laughs> JR is an Anglican. He is. <laughs> so what we want to do here is to to offer you the opportunity to uh, get in contact with and give us feedback and uh, forward us to your friends. Uh, why is that important, George? 
to share the work that we're doing and for us to be able to respond to issues and needs and questions that you have. Mm -hmm. Though over the past few weeks, I've received, Kevin and I have received dozens of emails uh, supporting our work, giving, uh, offering prayer and support, and that really is encouraging, and also ideas as to topics to cover and places to look at. Yeah, and the best way to do it is to send an email to anglicanunscripted at gmail.com. You can watch all the videos at anglican.tv. Uh, um, and next week, George and I are going to make a special announcement about a new website we're putting up uh, that uh, I guess you did. Oh, wait. You know what we just did? It's a cliffhanger. It's a <laughs> it's a cliffhanger. <laughs> we got a cliffhanger. So next week, tune in for our <laughs> conclusion to our cliffhanger. Uh, same bat time, same bat channel. Amen.